Wow, that was silence. Good morning. <laughs> We're so glad that all of you are here today. Glad that you are 
joining us for worship this morning here at First Presbyterian Church. Delighted that the Lord has brought you, whether it's in this room or you're worshiping with us online. We're glad, we're glad that you're here. And, and our, our great hope this morning is that you hear something about Jesus in such a way, maybe a new way, maybe for the first time, maybe for the most recent, and God uses it to draw you into a deeper relationship with him. That is our great hope. And you'll hear that wrapped throughout all of our worship this morning. If you will, uh, let's look at Psalm 38 as our call to worship as the Lord in there calls us to know him deeper. So please stand for our call to worship this morning and remain standing as we sing together. O oh Lord, do not forsake me. Be not far from me, O oh my God. Come quickly to help me, O oh Lord, my Savior.
may be seated. So last Sunday, Richard wrapped up the series in the Gospel of Matthew, and we heard about the fact that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, this powerful reminder of all that's tied together here. And this Sunday, we're going to pick up, our text picks up in John chapter 21, verses 1 to 19, and this is a text that comes at the very uh, tail end of after Christ has resurrected, and he has this amazing interaction with a few of his disciples, and this, uh, this great thing that happens with Jesus and these, uh, these men. This text is sometimes called an epilogue, and if it is an epilogue, I can say that it's perhaps the most important epilogue in all of human history because it teaches us something incredibly powerful about Jesus. And it also helps us to understand how the gospel does this continuing work in all of us. So if you will, uh, give attention now as I read from John chapter 21, verses 1 to 19. Let me read it for us. And afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciple did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you got any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Jesus, son of Simon, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Let me pray and ask the Lord to help us. Father, I ask that the words of our mouths and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. We ask, Lord, that you be with us as we look into your word. Lord, that nothing that I would say or do or have left unsaid or undone would in any way at all hinder the work of your spirit. Lord, do this work that you long to do within us, I ask. In the powerful and the awesome and the marvelous name of Jesus, I ask. Amen. So as many of you know, uh, I am new to the pastoral staff here at First Pres. And I I have to tell you, I've been asked uh, a number of times since I've been here, I've been here since November, I've been asked, how's it going? How are things going? And I I tell people, I'm not sure that they actually believe me uh, unless they know, but it's awesome. Uh, I I have to say with 
with all transparency, I'm telling you, uh, this is an incredible church. Uh, having been in ministry for about 32 years, I can tell you, uh, this is amazing. The staff here is awesome. The, the people here in this church are just, it's just really great. The Lord is really doing something. God is doing great things. I tell people too that sometimes when I'm here during the week, you know, at work, I'll have to shut my office door because there's a lot of laughter in the hallway, which is what you'd expect when your senior pastor tells such amazing jokes and brings a slingshot to Easter, right? It's awesome. Truly, uh, it's an amazing place. God is doing things. And one of the places that we see it, I see it often, is really in our children's ministry. We have an incredible children's ministry here, incredible, incredible staff. Our, our nursery school is off the chain. Our, our relationship with First Pres Academy, we've got so many folks that are pouring into the lives of little ones, of kids, of students. It's just this amazing thing to see what God is doing. Uh, and often during the week, I get to walk around the building from time to time. And just a few days ago, I was w walking uh, upstairs right outside of the sanctuary, kind of heading this way, because uh, there's a coffee shop right back there. And so uh, I think I'm a frequent person at that coffee shop. So I'm there, going to get a cup of coffee. And as I walk down the hallway, uh, you know, they've got the little ones in, in those big red strollers. Have you guys seen those? Those massive red strollers where they can put 75 children in a stroller. <laughs> It was fantastic. So I walk around the corner and, and I love to see that, all those little kids piled in that thing uh, and they're taking them around and those kids are just having the best time and just relaxed, kick back. And one little boy is singing and he is singing beautifully. And do you know the song that he was singing? Jesus loves me. Oh, that just knocked my socks off to hear this. I, I mean, he, he couldn't have been talking long uh, and yet he is just, just beautifully singing the song. I was so sort of taken with it that uh, uh, poor Claire uh, was in the bookshop and I pulled her out and go, hey, listen to this. And she's like, what's wrong with you? Like, it's like, this is fantastic. It was awesome. That this, little, this little one is singing that great little song. You, know, you guys know that song, right? You know, Jesus loves me, this I know for the... Right, you know it. It's great. It's powerful, isn't it? Beautiful to hear some little child sort of open up that song and sing it uh, without any kind of baggage hanging all over it. It's a beautiful thing. It got me to thinking, as I was uh, thinking about that later on, how important it is for us to be reminded that Jesus loves us. And that little boy was reminding me that Jesus loves me because the Bible does indeed tell us so. In fact, all the way through the Bible, this warp and woof of the Bible is a story of God's deep and abiding love for us made really personal in the flesh on Jesus. And so this little boy is singing this beautiful song, and I'm thinking about this, about the truth, the fact that the Bible does indeed tell us that Jesus loves us over and over again. Sometimes it's really right in your face. You can see it. Maybe like at Easter, you see it. Sometimes it, you kind of have to draw it out a little bit. Like in our text this morning in John 21, this is a part of scripture that actually screams at us that Jesus loves you. And not only that, but he actually at the same time points us to how the gospel continues to work in the lives of people who have put their faith in Jesus and how the gospel continues to work in and through their lives, even after they've come to believe in him and walk with him for a while. So before we get too far into our text, which is John chapter 21, verses 1 to 19, let me sort of set the stage for a minute and remind you who it is that we're talking about and what's happening in this text. And in John 21, 1 to 3, you can see it there that um, it says afterwards, and that's talking about that after the, the resurrection and after the disciples have had this kind of this interaction with Jesus, probably for a couple of times, kind of these distant sort of uh, conversations with him and these different sort of interactions with Jesus, afterwards uh, that Jesus appears to his disciples again, but this is how it plays out and who's there. Now the opening verses uh, of, our, of our text here, that, this had to have been very surreal for these seven men that are listed there. It had to be surreal because they're 
probably just coming to the realization that everything Jesus said would happen, happened, and everything he said he would do, he has done. And now it is sort of sinking in on them. And everything he has said that would happen has happened, and everything he said that, that, would, that they would do, they have done, including what he told them that would happen on the night that he was betrayed in that upper room. Let me draw your attention to what happens that night. Jesus has gathered his disciples in the upper, other, upper room. You can read about it in other parts of John's gospel. He gathers them there in order to prepare them for what's about to take place. When he gathers them there, he tells them he's going to, He's going to be betrayed, that he's going to suffer uh, unimaginably, not just by the, by the scourgings and the beatings and all that, but also on the cross, and that after three days, he would rise again from the dead. And then he tells them as well, and he said, and all of you will fall away. All of you, disciples, will fall away. It's at that moment that Peter has his, this great boast. You remember that boast? where he says he throws all of his friends under the bus, and he says, not so, Lord, even though all of these other jokers fall, fall away, I will not. I'll not do it. I'll die first. A lot of eyes in there, which got him in a lot of trouble. There was no ego in Peter, right? A lot of pride, a lot of ego in this moment when he says all this. And Jesus said, not only that, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. We know what happens, just as Jesus said, that's what happened. But in that moment, Jesus also tells them something else. He tells them that even though all of you will fall away, when I rise again, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. That's an amazing thing for us to pay close attention to what we're learning about Jesus in this instance. Because he already knows what's going to happen with these guys. And he already knows what's going to happen with us. And yet he says, I'll go ahead of you into Galilee. And that's where John 21 verses 1 to 3 picks up. Peter and these other fellows are in Galilee. In fact, specifically, they're on a boat because they went fishing at night. Now, let's remember again who these seven men are. They are men who have placed their faith, their trust in, in Jesus. They have made that statement. They believe it, Right. Uh, the crucifixion happens and their, their world is thrown upside down. But these are men who, had, who have walked with Jesus. They've seen Jesus do all kinds of things. Peter had even said that uh, when he asked, who do people say that I am? He said, you are the Christ. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. These aren't men who are waffling on belief. They, they have this belief in Jesus. They don't fully understand it before the crucifixion, but that's who they are. And yet, when this story opens up in John 21, they are seven men on a boat who had fallen away from Jesus at a critical moment in their lives and in the ministry of Jesus. Whew, that's pretty heavy, if you give it some thought. We don't know why they went fishing. It could have been because they needed to eat. Could have been because they needed to catch some fish in order to make some money. We don't know for sure why they went to eat, but we know that they didn't go for leisure because there's no Orvis gear mentioned. And this is hard work, right? Fishing with nets is hard. It takes a lot. It's grueling work. And they're out there at night, all night long, and they don't catch anything at all. That is until Jesus shows up. And this is where we begin to understand how the Bible tells us so. And we get a glimpse of how the gospel continues to work in the lives of his people. Take a look at this text in John 21, four through eight, we learn that early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. Now it's early in the morning. He's probably a hundred yards off the shore. So maybe that's why they couldn't see him. But the amazing thing is even from where he's standing on the shore, he can tell them where to catch fish. That should probably have clued them into something was going on. And so they have this have this conversation with Jesus where he asked them, friends, which is a, a great sort of uh, kind way, right? Friends, have you caught any fish? He's not making fun of them. Friends, have you caught any fish? No, they say. And so he said, throw your nets on the other side. And when they do, they start to haul in this great catch of fish, a large number of fish. That's when the disciple whom Jesus loved, it tells us, probably John, says, it's the Lord. And here's this amazing thing that happens. When they realize it's the Lord, what does Peter do? What does, he, what does he do at this moment? 
We're told he wraps his outer cloak around him because he had taken it off to work and he jumps into the water. He jumps into the water because he wanted to get close to who? To Jesus. Why? I don't know about you, but I know this about me, that when I know that I have wounded someone, it takes all I have to go back around them. Do you tend to avoid them too? Right? It says a whole lot about who Jesus is and who Jesus was in Peter's life that he knew, I need to be closer to Jesus. There was something about Jesus that drew Peter and kept drawing Peter, and that's the thing. It isn't, um, the thing about this whole scene here when Peter jumps into the boat tells us something extraordinary about Jesus that should resonate with us and teaches us so much about how the gospel works. Because when we blow it as people who have professed faith, when we blow it, it should make us run to Jesus even faster. Go closer to him because we realize there are places in my heart that I need Jesus even more. Peter, at least, knows that, does that, jumps into the water and tries to get to Jesus. But there's something else here, too. It says a whole lot that Jesus is on that shore in the first place, doesn't it? Because if he just wrote people off who blew it, he wouldn't be there. But Jesus is there. It tells us a whole lot about the love of Jesus that he has for us. It tells us a whole lot that he is there in the exact spot on that shoreline that he can call out to those guys in the early hours in the morning and tell them where to find fish. It tells us a lot about him. It tells us a whole lot about the gospel because the gospel begins with Jesus at work. It begins with God's spirit reaching out and pulling people to himself. That's what's happening here. That's how the gospel works. Even in our lives, even if you profess faith a long time ago, you've been walking with Jesus a long time or maybe a short time or maybe not even yet, that's how the gospel works. Things begin to churn in your hearts because God is at work moving towards us. That's what he does. That's how the gospel works. That's how the gospel starts. They weren't even looking for Jesus. They were fishing, but Jesus knew where they were and he goes looking for them. But it doesn't just help them catch fish. After they pull all that other fish to the shore, we find in verse 9 that when they get to the shore, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. That fire actually has come up in John's gospel before, chapter 18. Peter was warming himself by a fire when he denied Jesus. I wonder if the smell from this fire triggered something in his head. At any rate, they land on, and they find this fire already burning with fish on it and bread. Doesn't that strike you as amazing? That as they land on the shore, there's already a fire and there's already fish and there already, there's already bread. Do you know why? Because Jesus has planned this moment and prepared for it. Because he has every intention of inviting them to this breakfast with him. He has every intention of pulling them back to himself. He is not going to let their failure destroy the relationship he has with them. It is a love that will not let me go. And so they land on the shore. There's bread and fish. Did you ever wonder where he got it? It's already there, and he's cooking it. In verse 12 and 13, we find that Jesus actually tells them to go and bring the 153 fish that they've caught. That's a lot of fish. There's a lot left over, I'm sure. And then he says to them in, the, in verse 12 and 13, he says, come and have breakfast. And none of the disciples asked him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. And then he does this. He came and he took bread and he gave it to them and he did the same with the fish. This is the Lord Jesus who has now made breakfast for his disciples, all of whom had fallen away, one of whom had denied him vehemently, and he serves them a meal. This is astounding, and it is the way in which the Bible tells us so. It is a way that tells us how the gospel works. He doesn't turn them away, he doesn't cast them away, he searches them out, he finds them, he provides for them, and now he's inviting them back into a deeper relationship with him we know that it's how the way that meals work, right? When we invite people to come and have dinner with us, we, we do it because we want to get to know them. We want, we want to get to know who they are. We want to know about them. We want to have this relationship with them. 
This is more than just breakfast around a campfire, isn't it? It is an opportunity to be renewed, restored to Jesus for all of these disciples who had fallen away because that's what Jesus does. That's how the Bible tells us that Jesus loves us. It is this powerful thing that's happening in their lives. He's clearly renewing this relationship with them, isn't he? He's clearly inviting them back into fellowship with him. He is taking this step with them, and it is a powerful thing. It's really amazing. All of these men, at one time or another, had this argument about who was going to be the greatest disciple. They had this argument about uh, who was going to sit at Jesus' right hand. And then they all fell away. And some of that ego and pride, the eye-centeredness, got washed away. And now they're sitting around the same sort of fire where Peter denied Jesus, eating a meal that Jesus provided for them. It probably triggered something in their memory about Jesus, about another time when he had fed 5,000 or when he had broken bread with them before, maybe on the night in which he was betrayed. What a powerful thing. It's really amazing. A grand extension of love and grace and mercy. And it's the way that the Bible tells us so and shows us how the gospel continues to work in our lives, even if we profess faith in God a long time ago, this renewal of the gospel in the lives of these men. The thing is, though, Jesus doesn't turn a blind eye. The text doesn't end with this great scene. <laughs> It picks up with a really, really hard conversation because Jesus doesn't let things slide, not willing to let bygones be bygones because those bygones in Peter's life could possibly create a major stumbling block for him. They already had. His ego, his pride, all that other stuff had set up a moment in his life where he did the very thing he did not want to do. He was probably shocked that he denied Jesus. And yet he was quite capable of it because we have those sort of things in our hearts and our lives. And Jesus isn't about to just let those things go because he doesn't want anything to come between him and us, nothing. Because he has deep love for us and he has a purpose for our lives beyond anything that we could possibly imagine. And so Jesus has this hard, hard conversation with Peter. It may not seem hard as we read it. We may have grown used to it, but it is a tough conversation as Peter navigates this. And the truth is, we all need to hear this as well. And here's how it starts. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. And Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Did you notice how Jesus refers to Simon Peter? I hope so. Because what he calls him here, he says, Simon, son of John. Now, all the way through, G, through this whole chapter, we've seen Peter referred to as Simon or Simon Peter or Peter. But now in this instance, he is referred to as Simon, son of John. Now, I'm the youngest of six children, and I'm thankful for my siblings for lots of reasons. One of which is by the time that I came along, my parents were so tired, they, just, uh, they would just say my name. And I also knew at that moment, I'm in big trouble. Mark Anthony got my attention. Maybe Jesus is just trying to get Simon, son of John's attention. But I think more likely, as direct as that might be, it would have been cruel for Jesus to have referred to him as Simon Peter. Because Jesus had given him that nickname, and it meant the rock. As in, you're such a solid guy, where your word is your bond. Until it wasn't. 
And so in this moment, Jesus is approaching him with both kindness and directness because he loves him. And that's the way Jesus navigates things with us when he brings these things up in our heart and life and shows us what we need to deal with. And then he asks him three times a question that, that sort of aligned with the three times that Jesus denied knowing Jesus. Three times he said, I don't know him, I don't know him, I don't know him. And now Jesus is saying, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? To obliterate and wash out that moment. But he makes him relive it. Because he asked him the first time, do you love me more than these? Probably indicating his disciples. And remember, he threw those brothers under the bus. And now he's having to relive. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. It's painful. And that's probably a good thing as he's having to deal with what his past failures were. The painful business of facing up to his past was essential if Simon Peter, Simon son of John, was to make a new beginning. And I think he wanted to make a new beginning. And the thing is, that's the work of the gospel. What made him want to be back in good steps with Jesus wasn't Simon Peter, but it was the work that Jesus had already done in his life. That's the power of the gospel at work in the life of Simon Peter and these disciples. That's the power at work in us as God's spirit begins to work in us, drawing us back into this deeper relationship with him, pushing aside all the things that might trip us up. He pushes those aside in Simon Peter's life, making him deal with it, making him aware that it's there. Because the longer that we walk with Jesus, the more we realize how much we need him. We don't grow less dependent upon him. We grow more dependent upon him. And Simon Peter's beginning to figure that out as Jesus frames all of this under the context of love. He doesn't make him feel guilty. He doesn't make him feel shame. He doesn't make him walk around in sackcloth and ashes beating himself up. No, he doesn't. He restores him into this right relationship with himself, asking him based on this question of love. And then, amazingly, each time he tells him to feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, feed my sheep, follow me. He restores him, not just into this deep relationship with himself, but he restores him to the work that he had called him to in the very beginning. To love the Lord, to follow him, to serve him, to serve God's people, to advance his kingdom, to be a fisher of men, to make Jesus known. That's the work that Jesus is doing in this moment with Simon Peter. We need to be reminded of this as often as possible. We need to know as often as we can, that Jesus loves us. Not just one time, but all the time. We need to walk down the halls of a church and have a little cherub sing, Jesus loves me, as we're walking to get a cup of coffee, as often as possible. Because the Bible does indeed tell us so, over and over and over again, Jesus loves you, calls you to a deep relationship with him, calls you and puts a purpose on your life to advance the gospel to make Jesus known, because there's a whole lot of folks in Greenville, a whole lot of folks in this world who don't know that Jesus loves them and don't know the power of God to change their lives in a powerful, powerful way. And so I'm very thankful that this week I got to hear that little fella belt out that song. I'm very thankful that I got to be here this morning with you and talk to you about Jesus. Let me pray and ask the Lord to help us. Father, we ask, above all, that you would help us to know you in a profound and a deep way. We ask, Lord, that you work within us. Lord, I ask if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, that hasn't experienced the love of Jesus, and folks who have been here, Lord, and know you for a long time, I ask that they would all come to know you in a deeper way. Lord, transform our lives by the power of your Holy Spirit. Do that work within us that you long to do. And help us to see you do such things in such a way that we can stand back and say, look what God has done. And you would receive the glory and the honor and the praise. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and sing. How deep 
the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turned His face away as wounds which mar the chosen one. to glory Behold the man upon a cross my sin upon his shoulders ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among Boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Once again, to First Presbyterian Church, we are so delighted that you've joined us here in the Worship and Arts Center this morning, or if you're joining us on live stream, a special good morning to you. Um, We do want to welcome you if you are a first-time guest here, or if maybe a friend invited you or a family member invited you, um, we are so grateful that you have joined us. And one of our goals here at First Presbyterian Church, one of the things that we love doing and want to do alongside of you is invite you into a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ, as Mark just discussed. And and kind of the first way we do that is through what we call the Connect Card. Um, There's two ways to access the Connect Card. You can text the word connect to the phone number you see there on the screens or that is printed in your bulletin, or you can actually go online to our website, firstpresgreenville.org slash connect card and fill that out. Um, That'll help us get you plugged into a life group, um, a Sunday life group, a missional community, a Wednesday Bible study, something along those lines. But we want to see you getting plugged in and growing in your faith. Um, So go ahead and do that whenever you get a second after the service. Um, Also, coming up on April 21st, if you are a covenant partner here, we do need your help. On April 21st, we will be having a congregational meeting. And so I want to read this, and it's in your bulletin. 
Um, the session has approved a congregational meeting for Sunday, April 21st at 12 noon in the sanctuary and in the worship and art center. So right here to hear the report of the associate pastor nominating committee and vote on their recommendation for a congregational care pastor please plan to attend this important meeting. And so once Ignite concludes on the 21st, we're gonna ask that you just stick around for a few moments. We will be cognizant of your time and wrap this up in a timely manner. Um, but there has been a recommendation for a congregational care pastor. And as covenant partners, you will vote on that on the 21st. So please be present for that. Um, also this coming Sunday, next Sunday is Kirkin of the Tartan. Um, in the uh, 11, or 11 a.m. service, I keep doing that today, uh, the 11 a.m. service. And so if you want to celebrate your Scottish heritage, uh, please join us for, for that. That'll be just a fun service. Uh, also coming up May 3rd and 4th, is the Learning to Rest in God seminar. This is with Mark Patterson. And I'm telling you, this is going to be an incredible seminar. It's a Friday evening, Saturday morning. And God, all throughout the scriptures, invites us into his rest. He invites us to push back the responsibilities, the constant doing, the finding our value in a need to produce and to rest in him. And so Mark is going to dive into the in intricacies of the scripture and teach us all about this. Um, the cost is $60, and we do ask that you sign up, um, but this is, you, you don't want to miss this. This is going to be an incredible time. Also, that same weekend, uh, we do have a new members class here at the church. God is doing incredible things, and every time we turn around, there's guests coming in and people that we don't recognize and want to get to know, and it's clear that the heart of the city is being transformed, his Holy Spirit working through each of you. And so if you know someone who wants to be a part of this or you want to be a part of it, uh, that'll be May 3rd and 4th, and you can sign up online or email Linda Schultes, whose information is there in your bulletins. Um, also, I do want to tell you, you probably should get some Eclipse glasses because tomorrow at 3.09 p.m., there will be a, 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 a total eclipse here that is visible from Greenville. And so that's really exciting. You should get your Eclipse glasses. And for, from some of the people that I've heard online, the rapture is happening. Um, so I'm not entirely sure if all these announcements are even applicable because we might be gone. Um, so <laughs> most of us. Um, I do want to welcome, though, one of my good friends, um, Cameron Jones, is going to come tell us a little bit about the envelope fundraiser to, su to support the students going to the Dominican Republic. Cameron, welcome. Thank you, Charlie. Good morning. Um, I'm Cameron Jones, so I'm here to speak with you today about an opportunity to help contribute to the youth mission trip to the Dominican Republic this summer. So if you will look up at the screens, you're going to see a picture of me. Um, it's the one with the rainbow in the background. I don't know if they have it. There we go. Yeah. Okay, so this is from me, one of my first trips to the Dominican. I was a sophomore in high school. Uh, it was about 10 years ago. Um, so I want to say from the bottom of my heart, just thank you guys. Um, your generosity and your prayers really have changed my life, and I'm here to talk to you guys about that today. So 10 years ago, I stepped out of an airplane into the Dominican Republic, and I had no idea what God was about to do in my life. Thankfully, he knew, and my life has always been in his hands. My heart was transformed, and my life forever impacted by this mission trip. So now since my first year, I have been eight times, so four times as a leader and four times as a student. And I'm headed back again this summer. So now if you look up at the screens, you'll see a picture from our trip last summer. And this was right outside of the house that we had just finished. So yeah. Yeah. Um, and I go back as a leader now, um, hoping to make an impact on the students' lives, but also I get a front row seat to see God moving. In the past 10 years, I've learned more than I can share in a few minutes, but one thing I want to share is just how important it is for students to get outside of our culture and see God work in an entirely different world than ours. He's the same God here in Greenville, South Carolina, as he is in La Romana, Dominican Republic. Taking time away from our everyday to love and serve God's people will completely transform your heart. And that's what happened in my life. So this week we are kicking off our envelope fundraiser to help students um, go to the Dominican Republic. 
And if you feel led to donate after service, you will find tables. They'll be out there for like the next three three weeks. Yes, three weeks. Um, And so they look like this. And you'll see students out there with these envelopes. And they have different money amounts ranging from $5 to $150. Or if you feel led, you can cover one student's entire trip. We are asking that you return the envelopes to church by Sunday, April 28th. And also, I will be out at the tables as well if you have any questions. Again, I just want to say thank you guys for your generosity um, and just support as a church family. And I would also like to ask you guys for prayers for our trip this summer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cameron. And this trip to the Dominican Republic is an absolutely impactful trip. The gospel is being presented. Hard work is being done by our students. They're building things. They're leading Bible studies and vacation Bible schools. It is a life-changing trip. This is not just tourism. Um, this is not sending some kids to a, a tropical place. This is, I mean, they are spreading the gospel. And so it is absolutely incredible. And we thank you for your continued generosity throughout the years in supporting that. And so um, there will be several students as you walk. uh, Most of the entrances have tables beside them. So as you leave today, just grab one of those envelopes and return it. Um, As we come to a time of pastoral prayer, that that passage about Peter is so impactful. And I think a lot of times we tend to miss the weight of what actually was going on. Um, When Jesus, I mean, when Peter betrayed Jesus, that was a renunciation of him being his disciple. I mean, that was the equivalent of quitting a job or divorcing someone or absolutely turning your back on. And he would not have been considered a disciple after that. That is why in Mark chapter 16, verse 7, the angels at the resurrection say, go tell the 11 disciples and Peter, because he wouldn't have been counted as a disciple. And so when Jesus comes back for him, the weight of that extension of grace is unfathomable. It blows the mind to think that God in the flesh would come back for Peter of all people, the one one who turned his back on him in his moment of need, who renounced his connection to him. And yet this is what Jesus does for us over and over and over. First Presbyterian Church, Christian, you are not too far gone for the Lord to save you and bring you back into the fold. The invitation to come home stands. And so as we go into a time of prayer, let us thank God for the restoration and love that he offers to us. And we'll conclude with Psalm 38, verse 15. Let us pray. Father, this morning as your word has been opened and your name has been lifted high through song, as we've been invited to participate in your great story with a call to funding missions and going on missions, Lord, we thank you that you did not abandon us. Every one of us in this room and online have turned their back on you at some point. And and maybe it was a time where we sinned and we knew it was a sin, but we wanted to do it. Or maybe it was an opportunity to share the gospel and we walked away from it. Or maybe it's a habit that we picked up that does not glorify you in our lives and causes others to question our faith and your transformative power. And yet, Father, the message that we heard today ensures us that none of us are too far gone for your love. That your arm is not too short to save. Your grace doesn't have a limit. And so, Father, we praise you. We praise you because we're a people who need restoration. We're a people who need to know that we're welcomed home and that you call us and you will confront our sin. You will cause us to change and you will usher us into transformation, but you don't lock us out of your grace. You don't turn your back on us because your son paid the price for us to be saved. And so, Father, this morning, wherever we find ourselves, maybe it's in the midst of this habitual sin that we have. Maybe it's that we have grown apathetic towards you and we just stopped caring the busyness of life has taken over and 
we feel like we've gone too far, or maybe it's the same thing that we just get in this rut. Whatever it is, Lord, I pray that our hearts would be stirred because of your Holy Spirit. And Father, it is your kindness that leads us to repentance, and so Lord, show your mercy to us this morning. As we say together, as your people, I will wait for you, O Lord. You will answer, O Lord my God, amen. And as we continue in worship now, we uplift the tithes and offerings. all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I'm nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart singing hallelujah. Nothing else 
fit for a king except for a heart singing hallelujah First prayers, people of God, know that he loves you, he will restore you, and that you have not out the mercy of God. And so now receive your benediction. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ before all ages. Amen. We love you guys. You're dismissed. Thank you for joining us this morning at First Presbyterian Church of Greenville. We hope you have a blessed week. And please join us again next Sunday. The Grey Havens, American Christian folk pop husband and wife duo, are coming to First Press. Join us on Friday, April 19th at 7 p.m. for their 10-year anniversary tour concert. For tickets, please visit firstpressgreenville.org events.